Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with Reference Recordings. And today we're talking about Verdi's Otello. I mean, major opera, right? Serious opera. It has many recordings. It's kind of fascinating, actually, to talk about this one because a lot of you have said, well, reference recordings only happened back in like the 50s and early 60s. Aren't there any from like later? Well, this is one of the later ones, not that much later, I think 1978, but it is this one. It's Otello with Placido Domingo, Renata Scotto, and Cheryl Milnes as your three main characters. You also have Judith Blagan, Frank Little, Paul Cook, Paul Plischka, Malcolm King, Gene Craft, and Malcolm King again. He gets to sing twice with the Ambrosian Opera Chorus. Uh, let's see, the National Philharmonic, which was a recording orchestra, a pickup orchestra, actually, um, under James Levine. Now, this could be somewhat controversial as a reference recording, but it was because James Levine is still a bit on the outs owing to his you know, much publicized sexual peccadilloes, and some people still don't like him. Although now that he's dead, I suppose that makes less difference than it would have had he not, had he still been with us. But, uh, you know, Otello is one of those operas um, that requires a certain, I don't know, alignment of the stars to really, to really come off well. You need to have those three amazing principles, and here you do. Uh, and a conductor who is really on top of his game. And the irony of Otello, actually, is that, you know, I mean, Carrion recorded it a couple of times, and, you know, he had maybe the best Otello of all, and John Vickers, or at least one of the most heroic. But Placido Domingo owned the role of Otello after John Vickers did. Um, it really, he really did, very, very simply. And he recorded it, oh, I don't know, a hundred times, three times, four times, and videos and things, and... But here he was young in fresh voice, um, exciting and, and ready to rock. Renata Scotto was one of the great Italian kunst divas of the second half of the 20th century. That is a singer of real intelligence. I mean, we're talking about like Maria Callas intelligence, but she had a short career in the sense, well, she had a long career that but was short in terms of when we, when we encountered her. Um, and she recorded most of her major roles. I mean, her voice uh, soon left her, let's put it that way, for much of the same reason probably that Maria Callas did. That is, she gave 100% in everything she did, and she was such a smart singer and an expressive singer and fantastic. So she's an amazing Desdemona. She's not just your shrinking violet Desdemona. I mean, she, she gets what's going on here in a way. Um, and uh, it's really fascinating to hear her work with the text. And I mean, her Willow song is absolutely wonderful and heartbreaking. And, oh, it's just great. Um, and Cheryl Milnes, who was, you know, the, the uh, ultimate Verdi baritone, or one of them in the second half of the 20th century. He did all kinds of nifty, cool things. And his Iago is mean and nasty, but also an intelligent, thoughtful, it's a thoughtful performance. It really is. And, and James Levine. Okay, let's talk about James Levine. James Levine was an absolutely thrilling opera conductor. That was his life. That was his career. He was a student of George Sell, and he devoted his, uh, the vast majority of his, of his life to raising the standards of the Met and the Met Orchestra to really amazing, an amazing level. He was an extraordinary musician. For, for much of his career. Of course, he conducted, forget about the, you know, other stuff. He, he stuck around too long. He was old. He got sick. He got slow. He, you know, all of those things happened to him. Um, and, and so, you know, his later stuff is not, is not exactly uh, typical of his best work. But when he was on, when he was on in the 70s and the 80s, he was doing amazing work. Absolutely amazing work as an, as an opera conductor, and especially in the Italian repertoire, because people tend to poo-poo the Italian repertoire, you know, as, as, you know, the orchestra is just a big guitar, it just accompanies the singers, it has nothing else to do, um, and, you know, that's, that's true to an extent. I mean, you know, all these, 
all these you know, gross generalizations have an element of truth, you know, just like Wagner is boring and horrible. And, you know, these are all, you know, but but the the reality is that you have to judge each performance as it comes. You have to take every single interpretation for its on its own merits. And one of the things that Levine was able to do was to galvanize these orchestras to play with the, the rhythmic excitement of, of a Toscanini, as often as not, or a Zell, but also um, still understand the long melodic line, the vocal element. Um, Otello is, is special, along with Falstaff and various, well, actually, various last bunch of operas, you know, from Aida and, you know, on up, in that it, it gives an entirely new and more prominent role to the orchestra than, you know, Italian opera tended to in most of the 19th century. It really does. I mean, when you consider there, there are elements in Otello, which are like in orchestration textbooks, <laughs> the Otello's entrance, you know, in the last act for the, the double basses, you know, that was wonderful double bass solos, the very opening of Otello is, is a miracle of sonic sculpture. You know, it begins with a big crash on the tam-tam and suspended cymbals, which was sort of a new effect in Italian opera. And and an organ pedal throbbing throughout the entire first scene. It lasts like 10 minutes. Realizing the opera sonically is also another issue. It's a big issue. I mean, a really big issue, a difficult issue, because, because you know, you've got... Uh, to deal with that low, low pedal thing. And you've got two bass drums. You've got one under the stage. And what, it's, it's all kinds of stuff going on there. And it's very, very difficult to, to realize it sonically. Carion never managed to do it. One of the better ones, actually, was the earlier one with Tullio Serafin conducting. That also had John Vickers and Leonie Riesenick. It's a wonderful performance, by the way. I mean, for my, my, my money, that would have been the reference if this had not come along. Uh, it, it's a terrific performance. It's very well recorded. You know, Barbaroli, remember, did Otello and, and oh, it's just this flabby English cathedral organ sound <laughs> that's underneath the whole thing. It sounds like a some sort of subsonic defect. It's really strange. All kinds of odd things can happen there. You've got gigantic crowd scenes, and then you have incredibly intimate scenes. You've got Iago's Credo, which is which is, you know, one of the great nasty baritone soliloquies in all of opera. I mean, there's so many elements in Otello. But the other, the other thing that really astonishes me about this opera and that a great performance has to capture is that constant sense of forward momentum um, that is absolutely essential, absolutely essential. I remember very vividly, um, I was, you know, I had a subscription to the Met and it was almost an entire German season on my subscription. It was Strauss. It was, it was like Die Frau Schatten and the Ring and all this stuff. And in the middle of it was Otello. And I, I, I was going with a friend of mine, and she and I were, you know, went together, and we're watching Otello. And I remember the first act coming to an end, and we just looked at each other and said, "My God, that sounded like it took ten minutes after hearing, you know, an entire season of German opera at its most stately." Uh, this thing just flew. It was it was incredible. And Carlos Kleiber was conducting um, with Domingo. I mean, it was really it was really amazing how how exciting and how how. I mean, it's an opera that has no fat on it at all. It's all just drama and movement and and this this sort of roiling energy. And you you really get that in this performance. I mean, you really do. And and that is how I think it became the reference of the day. Um, and it still is. I mean, there is no better Otello out there. There really isn't. I mean, I, I, you, you do have to go sort of backwards to get better Otellos. You know, you have to go back to Vickers and Riesenek and Seraphin and, you know, some of the other earlier recordings because, because I, well, maybe the singers aren't around anymore who can do it justice in the way that these folks do. Certainly, um, you will not hear it better played, better conducted, better recorded, better anything than you do in, in this set. And so there you have it, the reference recording for Verdi's Otello. Keep on listening, friends. Thanks for joining me. Take care.